Hello, this is Branko Malic of Kali Tribune. In this podcast, we'll talk about the problem of identity in the rather wide uh, scope. That is to say, we'll cover uh, the metaphysical, let's say, or bet, maybe better to say ontological implications of this term. And as we customarily do, uh, attempt to relate those uh, determinations that are somewhat abstract uh, to everyday experience and to problems we treat on Kali Tribune that are uh, come into sphere of social problems. So this podcast, in a certain sense, will uh, be related to our previous one. Uh, that was about autoreferentiality and uh, uh, system uh, system creative creativity on internet in a philosophical, theological, and whatnot context, where <coughs> we have a sort of uh, um, counterfeits of uh, real intellectual uh, talks or in real ex intellectual expositions and so on. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, you can uh, easily find it uh, on the website. Now, identity is a term that uh, is uh, related, of course, with its complementary term difference. Now, identity and difference being complementary means that they are opposites uh, but are always related to each other. That is to say, they are not contrary. You have in logic this, this difference between opposite and contrary, uh, contrary concepts. And uh, not only in logic, but in everything. Because when you talk about identity, one of the uh, most common mistakes when you take uh, this term uh, that has a kind of absolute meaning a kind of uh, meaning uh, that transcends uh, the ev even everyday experience uh, one tends uh, to take it on face value and uh, somehow unconsciously uh, presuppose uh, wrongly that uh, this is the only possible meaning. So when we say identity, there is nothing contrary or unidentical in identity. This is false. Identity always in a finite word, world that is, uh, contains difference. Or is, to better to say, difference is implied in identity. This is very important. Uh, by implied I or implicated, I have, uh, I'm tr uh, giving a kind of um, ontological, ontological sense, uh, by, meaning by it that this is not simply something uh, logical and abstract, but something that is contained, for instance, when you have uh, um, I, uh, what we call personal identity. Uh, personal identity would be uh, in a, uh, let's say, a bit of a strained, uh, uh, strained definition would be a uh, let's say, who one is as a whole of his life. I don't... Uh, whenever I say whole in English, it sounds terrible because, because of my accent. It seems like I'm talking about whole, the pit, but I'm talking about the whole. Now, uh, the most simple... Uh, <laughs> the most simple solution would be to talk about totality. But totality and the whole are not the same thing. Totality, they can be if the, if the term is nuanced enough, but it is rarely a fact. For instance, totality 
or total identity, identity as totality, would mean the sum of the parts. Uh, in, in our previous podcast, for instance, we talk about systems, and systems are the sum of the parts, and the sum is more than a parts, but the parts are primarily, primary and initial elements of the, of the totality the system is. When I am talking about holes, not pits, <laughs> W-H-O-L-E's, uh, we are talking about uh, in a certain sense, um, something that is a priori, that is to say transcendentally, that is to say primarily complete. And only in so far as we uh, try to analyze it, to resolve it, please mark this word, res we will resolve something. And remember the word implicated. This will be something that will relate in a few moments. Uh, only then, namely when we try to resolve this whole into its elements, do we find the actual elements that are contained therein, but are in a sense different than it. Now consider what I just said. Implicate explicate, involve, resolve. This is the relation of complementary principles or complementary terms that identity and difference are. Mind you, this relation does not have to be understood as dialectical. In some sense of dialectics, it is dialectics is rather a nuanced, uh, nuanced term. But this uh, dialectics in a most common usage of the term implies matter. That is to say, it implies uh, the putting uh, things in opposition uh, because uh, the whole uh, that is to be reached through dialectical ascent, through opposites, uh, is not apparent in this, in the way. Uh, there is something in these opposites, in these finite, finite parts that, uh, that is, uh, that is an obstacle to seeing a whole as a whole. Uh, to illustrate, I mean, for instance, in Platonic dialectics, uh, dialectics of Ideas, you are, as Plato uh, 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 expounds in his Republic, uh, you have this uh, climb through uh, <coughs> first uh, the beings that can be seen, then through mathematical, geometrical principles and terms, ideal numbers, to ideas themselves, and then true ideas up to idea of good, that is hepekeina tesosias, as he says in Greeks, on the other side of being, that is uh, hyper-being, hyper or uh, uh, um, <coughs> that transcends both the spiritual and material world. Now, this is some of the senses, there is a sense of materialistic dialectics as is Mar in Marxism, but it's completely different thing that's opposite. But initially, I wouldn't say that this relation between uh, uh, the, the identity and difference is dialectical relation because uh, pro, uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, we'll try to investigate it uh, as it is and put forward some implications for everyday life and where we find these misunderstandings, for instance, of identity that are very peculiar to our age uh, and absolutizing a uh, kind of uh, craving for identity in a psychological sense. Because, you know, uh, psychologi psychological things, metaphysical things, logical things, uh, everyday things, uh, from shopping to celebrities, there is a common thread through all of this. So when we talk about something so lofty and abstract, seemingly, as identity difference, uh, there has to be a way to relate it to 
everyday experience. There is always this that cannot not be this. The great philosophers of the past rarely did this. But I mean really great philosophers. And then I mean Middle Ages and, uh, and Antiquity. Some of them, like Plato, for instance, interestingly enough, did this. Plato was very uh, prone to, to, to use this uh, common uh, setting uh, or, or mise-en-scene of, of common, common life where in his dialogues. But his dialogues were only part of his teaching. Uh, but most of the great philosophers kind of skipped through. They, they didn't consider this important. Uh, they had other purposes. And f this is one of the reasons they are not always uh, understood in our day and age. But that's a story in itself. Namely, <clears throat> identity and difference are complementary opposites. And this means that they go together and that their opposition can be something that is uh, only apparent, whereas in essence they are one. So in essence you would have something that is both one and not one. One and more or one, or one and, if that's possible, less than one. Uh, now what I mean by this, uh, when I said the whole is uh, has elements to which you can resolve it. This means when you resolve the whole into, el into elements, you don't chop it apart, you don't uh, reduce it to elements, you just resolve it to what is involved in it. Conversely, from this, you again can can explicate the elements into the whole that is implicated in them. Now you do notice from the uh, form I'm using and saying this that this kind of like naturally follows. Now to put things more concretely because <laughs> we are almost at 15 minutes and still didn't hit the floor or sidewalk of everyday life, let's see where this applies. This applies to soul. To take uh, the, the most common example, rarely used because, well, uh, we live in the world that doesn't believe in civilization, that doesn't believe in the existence of the soul anymore, although it uses all its determinations when speaking about human being denying only what is most essential to it and that's that it is immaterial and imperishable and absolutely simple absolutely in a relative sense because there is a relative absolute relative absolute is something that is unattainable to to a being that is under it in the hierarchy of creation so uh soul could be understood as a relative absolute towards the body because body is contained in the soul. Now this is this relation between uh, the whole and its uh, elements, its parts, let's say, that is far different from relation between totality uh, or, or yeah, totality, total system and its uh, segments, uh, individual parts. So, uh, soul is the act or energy that animates the body. This means that body is contained in the soul because soul, which is a pure energy, pure activity. Now this word energy, uh, New Agers misuse it very much, but this is the proper term in Latin in Latin, uh, Latin uh, thinkers, I peruse uh, as Thomas Aquinas, it's operatio or, or actus. But this is translation of the energia, Greek energia. Energia means ergon, uh, erga means works. Ergon means something like a uh, work, unit of work. Energia comes from en, this means in. Ergi, ergon, which means work. This means 
something that is in work. Uh, there is a finite, finite uh, implication to this word. Uh, something that is finished, complete. But there is also this implication of activity, of fluidity. And Greek language, and I'm proud to say my Slavic language, other Slavic languages, kind of give you a hint of this, in even in the sound. Uh, something that you don't get so much, for instance, in Latin or, or, or maybe in English. Uh, although if English is properly used, some other terms can give you these impressions, but it's, it's, it's apparent. So this is soul is energy of the body, not in the sense that it is produced by the body, but in the sense that body is not produced, but made alive, that is to say, made and sold by it. Now, body and soul, I think you will agree with me, are in a sense opposites. But also, they are complementaries, because... Uh, Whereas you can think about soul without body, you can't think about body without soul. Now, I know this is not a very modern way to look upon it, but uh, logically, uh, in fact, it follows. Because soul is that ontological principle that makes body a body, a definite body, a human body, an animal body, a dog's body. Uh, a body of a, of a plant, and so on. Whereas, it is not the other way around. The reason is uh, that material cannot determine what is not material. And this also means that part cannot determine the whole. The, the soul is a priori whole. One more time, W... <laughs> H O L E. I, I pronounce this really terribly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not the pit, but the whole. Uh, it's by definition whole because when you take soul, its presence in the body is at the same instance, in the same act, immediately in all parts, conceivable parts in the, of the body. Whereas, it is in none of them in particular. For instance, chop my leg off after some screaming and shouting, or maybe I would take it as a man and never utter a sound. I would remain the same person I was because soul and person are convertibles to an extent also. Uh, whereas you cannot say this for body. If you take soul from the body, you cannot take soul from the leg. You have to take it all the way. The body is that. And this body is not me anymore. Except maybe in resurrection. <laughs> but that's a different thing. Although you would be surprised how philosophically, in fact, can it be related to this. And how, how fulfilling philosophically it even is. Uh, resolving some questions that uh, troubled philosophers from the antiquity. Uh, so the, 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 the relation between whole and part, identity and difference, is very uh, natural here. It is congeniality. It is undivided. Identity and difference are divided only in resolution analysis because analysis and i never tire of repeating this analysis means untying it's not the uh, the the chopping in parts it's not reduction it's uh, like grasping into full reality uh, and uh, trying to resolve this reality to pull it out towards you to, to, to use somewhat uh, naturalistic image, but that's maybe the best way to approach it, to have a kind of feel this uh, uh, really uh, the sense of the meanings, if I may say so. Um, so this is uh, uh, one way to look at 
identity and difference. Now, identity, I don't really like the word identity because it is, it all, there is always implication. This is because it's contaminated with layers of meaning that were, that I don't think are good, that sedimented through history. There is always this notion of abstract identity. And I will say a few words about that. We talked about the good for 20 minutes. Now we'll devote 10 minutes to bad things to make it a proper, uh, proper ratio. Identity in a systemic sense, as we already said, is something opposite. I noticed that identity became very important to people nowadays, especially to people through which I have contact or access to today thoughts, reflections on the internet. Most people uh, I know in everyday life do not have this problem. Uh, by this problem, I mean that people are trying constantly to find something to identify with. And as I spoke in previous podcasts, and I won't go deep into it again, uh, people change, for instance, religions, as I said, socks. But let me be more gracious and say change religions as normal people would change philosophical standpoints. This is something far more gracious and far less accurate, but for the sake of goodwill, I'll, I'll use this, uh, this term. Now, why identify? That's something I don't really understand because, for example, one, when you study, study philosophy, uh, you will, if you're really in for it, you'll find some philosophical school or tradition that you'll call your own. Uh, for instance, I would say Platonist, Neoplatonism. If we are talking about completely this non-Christian philosophy, Neoplatonism is very good uh, entrance, opens many doors uh, with due uh, uh, reservations, of course, and to uh, world religion as Christianity, simply uh, for reason that it uh, it is a fusion, seamless fusion of Plato and Aristotle, and thereby a seamless fusion of classical antiquity, classical antique, uh, antique uh, mentality, the best of its metaphysics, and uh, gives you uh, discipline, that you will apply uh, later. But being Christian, being Catholic, uh, or something of that sort, even being Muslim uh, in Bosnia, I am always using these localisms. I'm sorry, but there is a quite a difference uh, between being religious uh, in this uh, traditional way for hundreds of years, when you can trace your family being religious in one, re belonging to one religious religion uh, in generations, and uh, being able to change three or four of them in your lifetime without anybody paying you for it. Uh, th this is uh, rather different. And I don't understand why, if you, for instance, love let's say for the sake of argument some muslim uh, muslim theologian let's say ibn arabi sufia the prince of sufia of, of sufis was for instance uh, very uh, uh, rene genon was very fond of him why would you have to become muslim because of that this is something i was always at pain to understand because uh, whereas these ten points of thinking of thought uh, where you find some things appealing, maybe sometimes in your life, for 10 years after that, you won't find them so appealing. Because those are instances of metaphysics. And metaphysics is something that you are never sure you got right. But being religious and being belonging to religion is something quite different. Because this is something 
you don't know maybe why you belong to if you convert it to it you don't know sometimes you don't know why you convert it. sometimes you do good things for, uh, because of religious impulses that you don't understand you have no clue what drew you to do this it felt right and you did it but for the life of you you cannot explain why and maybe only maybe later in life you figure out why and then you realize maybe angel was talking whispering in your ear but you didn't know that maybe you never believed that the angels exist but you listened to him so this is quite different and i think uh, i want uh, i am giving you an example of this and this kind of identity that is so sought for uh and identity, for instance, when uh, to to take another example, when they say on internet, I identify as, and uh, I, I noticed what is very irritating and very popular now, for instance, as a liberal or as a black man or as a, uh, I don't know, gay or as this, as this, that I want to say. So first thing is, uh, show your papers, show your identity, put your identity in the face of your interlocutor and then only proceed to talk. Uh, to be rude, I'm sorry, I don't give a fuck how somebody identifies. Because having an identity means being something and what you are, you don't choose. This is a very, very simple thing. You don't choose. How you think, how you act, what you do, yeah, that you choose to an extent. But what you are, you don't choose that. You don't get to choose that. No, I don't think it works that way. Of course, there is this transformation or transmutation of one's being in fate, for instance. But this is completely other thing. This is rather like, uh, even like dissolving of identity rather than strengthening of identity. Of course, this is uh, for sure, I can say this is a dissolution of any false identity. What we tend to call ego. But ego is also a very complex term. There is, There are many implications in the term ego. Uh, least of all psychological. It's a metaphysical term. And I would conclude that this kind of systemic identity is in fact it inversion of the uh, authentic uh, metaphysical identity that we uh, just um, put forward as an identity uh, of soul with the body and uh, imply the difference of soul and the body where you have these complementaries that naturally flow from each other whereas in this other kind of identity you have system and contradictions are more like dialectical. They are reflections of consciousness. So, for instance, at one point you identify as this, uh, then you have a better idea, then you identify as that. And all the time one is trying to project oneself uh, in a kind of mirror of one's learning, one's political ideas, and all of them have to be seen by other people, hence identifying, because they cannot exist in themselves. They are made of parts, and only thing that uh, keeps them together is subject, the I, the ego. And ego needs other egos to... Uh, to affirm its existence, it's very vulnerable. It's metaphysically vulnerable uh, being. Okay, <laughs> this is uh, we are we are coming to a precisely half an hour talk. We we won't go we go won't go further. I think that this is has been a meaningful whole. That is to say, W H O L E. Uh, the uh, organically uh, let's say complete uh, complete podcast about organically complete being uh, and I think that the example of the soul uh, body and soul and their conjunction 
is something that is very good to contemplate further. Thank you for your attention. This was Branko Malic of Kali Tribune signing out. Mm -hmm.